So we win together, we lose together is the mantra here. Um, individual success is is not accepted or tolerated in in this way, really. The question is, from Thinking Focus. Hi, I'm Ricky. Hi, I'm Paul. And today, the question is, what five things should leaders be focused on in 2023? That's fascinating, isn't it? Because there's an implication in the question that this year's got five different things to every other year that's ever been. I'm not sure that's true. I think it's probably the same five things leaders should focus on um, almost every year, or maybe all the time. I think the difference right now is one thing. Well, oh, well, okay. So what is that difference then? The the level of uncertainty that we're that we're leading through. You know, I mean, if you haven't noticed, it's a bit weird out there. Well, like like what? Yeah, I know. That's exactly. Well, I think I think that is a challenge, isn't it? It's been weird for so long. We're starting to think this is normal. Exactly. And I think I think that's the important thing here is that it's easy to get sucked into the fact that we've just normalized this and everything's fine but the reality is the world is changing on a on a regular basis you know you think about the uh, the energy prices the conflict in the ukraine continues um and, and that's just two of the big things at the moment the economies are all over the place you know in the uk we've got this you know run on inflation etc so yeah high political uncertainty low investment you know huge amounts in the uk of political unrest and strikes and the day we're recording this i think we're the only two people in the country working i think you and i today um we are starting to sound a little bit like radio four though <laughs> we are yeah yeah so the shipping forecast coming up shortly <laughs> <laughs> oh I'd, I'd love you to do that i don't even know I, it's got the thing dogger in it and i'll just start giggling so we can't do that um <laughs> Uh, let's get back on track, shall we? Okay, let, let's go through five things then. Where would we start? What what What's kind of a good place to start with this? Well, when you said five, what struck me was those five things that came out of that piece of work that was done inside Google and known as Project Aristotle. Do you remember that? Oh, yes. We, we do quite a bit on this, don't we? Yeah, um, because I think they are sort of five steering lights to great leadership to can, can you put these things in place um and i i suspect we're not going to do them justice <laughs> uh, we're not, definitely not going to do them justice in 10 minutes but we can summarize them because they're really important points and so the first one was um, i always sort of talk about it as meaning of work but purpose you know, leaders have a key responsibility to establish purpose for the people that are following them why are we doing this what's this about where are we going what's the journey so this is through an organisational lens, particularly. Well, I think it's at every level, isn't it? Because you go, it's really easy to go, I work for company X and our purposes. You know, we, we're a tiny business and we have our belief statement and our mission about, you know, I, just if you've never come across us, it's we believe that people get in their own way and they don't need to. And it causes them to underperform and, and you can, by understanding how you think, you can fix that. And that's our kind of meaningful vision and purpose. But I've worked for some very large organizations. And while I buy into the purpose at a top level, you know, I'm not always convinced I really understood what that meant for me at my level. Uh, so, so what we're saying then is leaders have really got to find a way of bringing that to life almost at either a business unit or a team level so that we can understand how we connect to that bigger picture. Yes, exactly. And that concept of a golden thread that says, look, our, our team's purpose is to do this thing here, you know, to to do a particular marketing piece or sell to a particular community or work on a particular product or do a piece of innovation. How does that connect to what our boss's boss's group is doing and all this division is doing? And how does our division connect to to the strap line that I see on the adverts on the TV? <laughs> you know, those five or six words that, yeah. that say yeah, something yeah. really in the ether up there um and i think that is a key leadership role how do you bring that to life for somebody and i think for some roles that's easy we work with a lot of sales people and it's not that hard to connect the vision of the organization to you know and we take the products and we explain to customers what they'll do for them yeah i, I mean the example i always kind of lean on particularly when 
when you're working with with clients is the the old nasa example where somebody asks him what he's doing and he his response is um yeah you know he, he he's sweeping the floor and and they kind of go well what are you doing well i'm helping to put a man on the moon he understood that keeping the environment clean and dust free was a significant factor in the success of that mission yes and and understood how that connected up all the way up yes and i think that i love that story i always remember being we were with a client a group of managers uh and i, I you know and i threw that story out and we were talking about that and i said so you know, give me an example of somebody in one of your teams and we'll play with it as a group well how do we connect them to the vision because they yeah. in the morning the ceo had been in and presented to this group of very senior people this is where we're going this is our three-year plan um and the workshop was about connecting them to it and uh, they one guy went accounts payable ledger clerk oh, <laughs> <laughs> which is yeah. exactly what i went i went oh me and my big gob um but but you think about it for a second and go well okay for us to achieve this vision as an organization to be where we want to be in three or five years time we have to have absolute confidence that somebody at the back end of this is making sure the money comes in, that when there's problems with the money coming in, somebody's across that, that somebody's aware of it, that we're talking to our, to our customers about challenges or we're talking to our suppliers about challenges in, in payment profiles. And, you know, you may go, well, that doesn't feel as glorious or as, as, as exciting as being, you know, product innovation lead. No, but but the reality is, if we haven't got the money coming in, it makes it really hard yeah. to go and fulfil your your vision, your strategy, your mission, and maybe your purpose. Which is a lesson you learn very much so when you start your own company, but you probably don't of course. realize when you work for a big company because somebody in the background is just doing that that task. Yeah, but it was a it was an interesting one because I got really challenged on it to go actually as a leader. How do you make that meaningful and the work? the purpose of that, you know, relevant to the vision of the organization. And that then flips to the second thing that they talk about, which was kind of, which I call meaningful work, which was, do I make a contribution? So this, this is how do I, not just how I fit, but is what I'm doing actually going to add some value here? Yeah. Because have you ever had a job where you think, do you know what? If I didn't turn up, it wouldn't make any difference. Because I have. I only did it for a few months because it was soul destroying. Are you still here, or are we talking about one before? I'm just just checking. Right, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> you get my point. Without, I do. You know, I do. Um, it, it, and and so as a leader, sometimes we have to take the time to make sure people understand that their work is valuable and they are valued. Yeah, because if you do want them to to deliver at their highest level of contribution, that's kind of important, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, I think, again, it's easy to focus on roles that have um, kind of quick wins. Again, I'm going to use sales as an example. You know, salespeople have a win every week sometimes. They're selling all the time. They might be selling every day or every month or you know, even even in if you work on long lead time, big sales stuff like I've worked on, you're going to get one or two big projects a year or a key event happening in a sales milestone. But there are other roles, you know, marketing roles, for instance, that I've done in the past where you kind of go, oh, just doing the same thing today as I did yesterday. And does anyone care? And does it matter? Well, and I think it's really interesting because I spoke to our marketing agency the other day um, and you look at the data and you go how how do you even know this is working and and something like marketing is it is about consistency and all those things and and actually you don't get perhaps the the dopamine hit that you do in sales yeah and, and we see that a lot when we see sales people moving to other roles that they almost come slightly depressed because they're, they're dopamine addicts to a certain extent yeah yeah they're getting they're getting a little little buzz every day of a win but i think i think as a leader it's a really interesting question to go. I have key people working on things that might be, they might be working on over a long period of time. How on earth do I keep these people you know, aware of the relevance and what they're doing and the importance and connected to them? And I always think of there was some work done, and I'm going to get this wrong, by um, Adam Grant in the US where he was working, did some research, I think it was in a university. 
Um, and he noticed that he, he got a group of um, students who were collecting, um, I think it's an American thing, collecting money uh, from alumni, from people who'd studied there to then pay for scholarships for more people to study there. So they would phone up and go, hello, I'm, you know, I'm Fred from the uni and, you know, would you like to give a donation? And one of the things they, they noticed was if you then brought in somebody who was receiving scholarship funds to talk to that group of people doing those roles about the impact that their work was having on them as an individual. They felt it was more meaningful because they could see the fruits of their labor. But actually, the amount of money they collected shot up. Wow. Well, because they were probably more energetic, more passionate, more bought into it. Because yeah. they could see it did make a difference to people's lives, i.e. the... Yeah, and their work had value and made a, made a difference in the world. Um, and then you think about, you know, the conversation of the day with somebody who's going, I've got a load of people and they take calls every day, you know, the call, it's a typical call centre, we need to keep the calls as short as possible so we can get to the next one and we don't have a queue. And it's easy to forget that actually every time they take a call, they're sorting out a problem, they're helping somebody, they're doing something quite significant yeah, yeah, the person yeah. on the other end of the phone. Well, they could be protecting the brand. They could be protecting the customer. They could be helping a customer, delivering that um, that exceptional service that, that yeah. they aspire to give. And, and actually, that takes a little bit of empathy in order to, to relate to the customer and kind of put yourself in their shoes and, and make it feel like we care. And it's easy to forget that when you're doing the role, and therefore you come back to what is the leadership role in this? It's to constantly drip feeding reinforce good news stories look what we're doing look how many people we've helped look how many people we've supported yeah here's a testimonial from a customer who's phoned back to say thank you all that kind of stuff to just go it, the work is important it's meaningful we didn't pick a load of people to do this because we couldn't think of a better way of doing it we picked human beings to do it because we want the impact that you guys can provide yeah positive reinforcement go catch people doing the things that you want them doing and they will repeat it, and they'll yeah. they'll do it with with purpose. And tell everybody, everybody, absolutely. Okay, so that's two of five. We're going well. Two of five, yeah. We're we're going really well. Um, if I remember rightly, the third part is about clarity. It is. This is about everybody knows what's expected, who's responsible for which bits. Yeah. Um, in terms of we know what our goals are. And we know who's got which bits of the goal. Yes. And I, I think, for me, there's two things here from a leadership perspective. One is, have you made that clear? You know, Have you actually spent the time and the effort and made sure everybody knows exactly what they need to do and what the expectation is? And Well, because the danger is you've got people going off in all directions, busy fools, as opposed to focused and very deliberate in terms of what they're doing is aligned to that purpose um, that we're trying to deliver. Yeah, busyness as opposed to business. Yes. Oh, I like that. I might use that. It, uh, it, it, it took me years to work that out that, that business is busyness, <laughs> and I never worked that out. And then one day it just clicked, and you go, oh, okay, that's where it's come from. But, yeah, I, I agree. I think I think if you haven't created the clarity, you can't assume it's there. And so you need to be having that debate constantly. The second part, I think, sits with a leader, which is, I think, slightly more controversial, is the grey areas. It doesn't matter how well you've done the clarity. It doesn't matter how well you've, you know, worked all the bits out. You won't have covered everything. So are we saying there's 50 shades of grey or...? This podcast is taking a completely different direction, isn't it? Yeah, well, you started it. I know, I did. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so I think I think there's there's the new stuff that comes in, new requirements, new needs. Right. Who's got it and what have we got to do? Yeah. And how does that fit in and how does that affect everything else we're doing? And what are we dropping? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because we're not an infinite resource pool that just keeps on taking requirements. Um, but the other side of it is is the, the borders, the edges. Um, and I always love that story you tell a lot about when you were when you were doing um, uh, financial service sales, uh, about the the sort of boundary between the sales group and the back office. Not 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 a proud example. Um, <laughs> Sorry. But, <laughs> well, it, well, you know, in terms of, you know, we were tasked with winning new new business, um, and what we didn't do was engage with our. Uh, colleagues who would process the business that was won. Uh, the net effect in that was actually 
um, customers didn't get insurance put on risk at the right time um, and the business lost revenue. So, you know, we failed on all counts in that. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and for me, I learned a valuable lesson because, you know, both as, you know, as a manager, you go, actually, my success depends on others. How do I engage them? How do I involve them? Um, but as a leader, how do I remove the blurred lines? Exactly. And I think, I think it's that bit, it's that boundary between, you know, your department or the bit that's clearly your responsibility and the bit that's clearly their responsibility. That's the hole where most things go wrong. And it's a leader's responsibility to go, I'm not going to allow that to happen. Yes. Yeah. If, if I see a hole, if I see no one's got this, even if it's not mine, even if I know it's not, you know, in the role description for my department, I'm committed to the bigger picture. I'm committed to that purpose, that vision that we had, that, you know, talked about five minutes ago. I'm going to go fix that. And, and, and this is more common than you think it is. Um, yeah. Because... You know, it's the good old assumption piece where we just, well, they'll pick it up. They'll pick it up. Um, and the problem is, without having a way of surfacing that, you know, having a conversation about, so who has got this then? Who's picking that up? Um, things get dropped. Things get missed. Things fall through the cracks. Um, and and they can be. one. I, I, we've been working with a client in the last um, last week, and we – we found, um, I don't want to talk about the detail, um, but we found that they'd assumed one team had got it. The other team assumed they got it. And basically, one key step in the process meant they couldn't open a new facility and they'd recruited everybody. And these people have been basically waiting, um, being kind of farmed out to other units for over two months and they still yeah. don't have line of sight about when that pro problem will be resolved and that comes back to the sort of racy argument doesn't it which is the, yeah yeah, yeah. The a and accountability can only ever be one person a absolutely and i think here i think here i'm saying that the leader is responsible for everything where nobody is allocated to the a yes if there is no name against the a and you're the leader it's you it's you yeah now that doesn't mean you do the work you might choose to make other people responsible for doing the work but until you have an owner it's you and that that's quite good because that leads lovely beautifully into uh in the fourth one in alice which is dependability yes which my understanding of this is actually this is about we can count on you to do what you said you were going to do i think that's 50 percent of it i think dependability is two things it, it's uh, do I know you're going to do what you're going to do? Do I trust you to do the work? And the other half of it is, do I trust you to have my back? Oh, okay. Because I think, you know, in a leadership environment, what you're trying to create is an environment where people are supportive of each other. It's not that I can just trust you to do the work, but you know when you're doing the work, if it gets hard, if it's more complex than we thought it was going to be, if something goes wrong, there is a team of people behind you that have got you. So not only am I, you can count on me to do what I said I was going to do when I said, and to the right standard, by the way, but also of course, actually I can depend on you if I need you, if I'm, you know, if I'm struggling or perhaps falling behind or something's, yeah. a, something's occurred that I wasn't necessarily foreseeing when I originally made the commitment to do that for the group yes. or you or whatever it might be. Typical sporting analogy. Imagine a football team where if somebody falls over or gets badly tackled and they're lying on the ground, the rest of the team went, well, that, that area of the pitch now is not covered because it's not my job. And I know you can imagine the football team because there is a couple that do play like that, but it's not, <laughs> not, mine, not mine at the moment. <laughs> yeah, let's not name them. For, um, but, but you get the point, which is it's a team. Yes. Right? Part of being in a team is that stuff's going to happen and we've got each other's back. And if you've got a level of self-interest, you've got a level of, you know, people basically doing their own bit, regardless of what happens in the rest of the team. And, and it's not as uncommon, as, you know, we sort of joke about it in the football analogy. It's not uncommon. I see it in sales teams all the time. I'm going to hit my target. Why should I help him? Yeah. And, and also, I'm going to hit my target. And if the business doesn't hit theirs, well, I've done my bit. Yeah. And you go, no, you're a team. 
You're in it together. That's the point of teamwork. And and the leader needs to call that out and foster that environment to go, it's a team. We win or we lose together. I like that. You know, no football team no football team walks off the pitch going, We lost, but we had a great day in defence. No, no, you didn't. Well, they couldn't have done. They lost. Well, yeah, okay. We had a great day. <laughs> we had a great day. In, we had, uh, you know, the, the strikers were fine. It was just defence that screwed up. I mean, they, again, they probably do try that game, but it's like, but you lost. Two weeks later, the only thing anyone cares about is the score. Well, yeah, and that's the only thing that gets written down in history, isn't it? Yeah. In the same way as the goalkeeper can have a terrible day, but if the other team's goalkeeper has an even worse day... <laughs> He's fine. He's fine. So I think I think dependability is is... It's got to be those two things. It's got to be more than just going, yeah, I do my job. It's I do my job and I'm part of the team. I support the team. I step up when I have to step up. And I know in my heart of hearts that everybody else will do the same for me one day. So we win together, we lose together is the mantra here. Um, yeah. Individual success is is not accepted or tolerated in in this way, really. Yeah, and I think those four things, when you go, so now you think about what we've talked about. We've got people, a leaders create a team where people know what they're doing, sorry, why they're doing it. They know that their role is valuable and their individual co- contribution is meaningful. They know exactly what's expected of them, what they've got to do. Um, and they know that if stuff falls through the gaps, someone's going to grab it and deal with it. So what's the big finish then? Well, they're trusted to do the work. They're trusted by, you know, they, they know their team's got their back the big finish is psychological safety, that they're in an environment where they can challenge and confront and share and they can say, I'm not sure about this bit or can I ask a question? It's a really open, fluid environment that has really candid, honest conversations. And what Google identified was of of all the five, this was the most important because all the others kind of fall by the wayside if you if you don't feel safe if you don't feel like your teammates have got your back if you you know if you're feeling vulnerable you can share it you can challenge but challenge in a way that's uh what i would always describe as helpful intent so your your challenge is not about having a go at an individual it's about how do we move this forward how do we move the needle yeah and i think i think that's the thing with safety it's not I, I, I always think of it as going psychological safety is somewhere between fear and friendship. We're not so close that I don't want to hurt your feelings. On the other hand, we're not so far apart that I'm worried about your reaction to what I'm going to say or the consequences of what I'm going to say. Yeah, We can be honest and open and candid. And sometimes that's not going to be comfortable, but it is going to be safe because I know you've got my back. I know that you know I'm doing it for the right reasons because I'm committed to the purpose. And that's why I think those five things are really interesting that try and do safety without the other four. It doesn't stack up. No, no. Well, exactly. And I think that's probably why it is, well, it, it's not probably, it is why it's the number one. And I think the other thing that kind of came out from this was it's not about the who of teams. It's not about what they're working on. It's the how. And these five things are the how of teams which is why we would foster that, that, you know, that recommendation almost that says focus on these five things and, and you won't be far off where you need to be in 23. Exactly. Um, because, you know, if you've got these five things, it doesn't matter what comes up. It doesn't matter how challenged you are or how crazy the world gets or, you know, how challenged your plans become because everything changes in front of you you've got a group of people that are capable of adjusting and adapting and dealing with it. Next time on The Question Is. Imagine you're in the room you're in at the moment and on the right-hand side of the room, you go, that's you own your career. It's totally down to you. No one's going to help. The left-hand side of the room, it's the company's responsibility. They need to train you and work things out and promote you. Where would you be standing in the room? To find out how Thinking Focus can unlock the potential within your organization, go to www.thinkingfocus.com, where you'll discover more about the work we do, helping our clients increase productivity and enable change.